Greetings and welcome. We are in junior English and our objective for the hour is to introduce the great American poet Walt Whitman. <laughs> our job here is to set up this poet in terms of his context and then to speak specifically about the work of his life and the poetic work of his life, especially Leaves of Grass. Before we get there though, let's make some quick observations for your notes about the context that Whitman lives and works in. The first thing that we want to say is that Whitman is part of that holy trinity, as I've sometimes referred to it, that important three great radical transcendental thinkers of American thought. In order, Emerson, followed by Thoreau, followed by Whitman. Now I know that you've already listened to a teaching company lecture on the, uh, the, the poetry of Whitman, but let's go back over this just to make sure. Emerson we think of as the great thinker. He's the academic. He's the writer of essays. Thoreau is the great doer. He's more radical than Emerson. He looks at the ideas, for example, of, of Emerson and self-reliance and he says, hmm, that he's totally self-reliant. I don't know if a philosophy like that can actually be lived. I'm going to try it. And for two years, he goes to the pond that we know of as Walden, where he tries to live pretty much self-sustaining. That is to say, Thoreau is more radical than Emerson. He takes the ideas of Emerson, and then he tries to practice them. That's what we mean by calling him the doer. There were things Thoreau did that, by the way, Emerson said, whoa, 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 that's too far over the line. All I said was, you know, trust thyself. I didn't say anything about being so radically individualistic that, for example, you don't pay taxes if you don't believe in what the government's doing. Emerson couldn't go there. Thoreau was more radical than Emerson. The third in the Holy Trinity is Whitman. And Whitman is the radical, radical poet. Whitman goes way over the line. I mean, there's, in his first meetings with Emerson, Emerson told him, dude, you got to tone this way, way back. Thoreau respected Whitman, but saw Whitman as too radical even for Thoreau. So, I mean, think about that. Whitman is more radical than Thoreau. Thoreau sees Whitman as a little too far over the line. For example, Thoreau will be, I mean, he's an abolitionist, but Whitman will write poetry in which he says whites and blacks are the same, equal. No one had written poetry like that before Whitman. So he's, he's a radical in terms, of his, in terms of his poetry. Let's talk about his biography for a little bit, because that also is very, very revealing. Unlike Emerson, unlike Thoreau, born with a silver spoon in their mouth, with money, with bank, Harvard graduates, that kind of thing, Whitman is none of that. Whitman grows up poor. He knows what it's like to grow up in a working family. Now, for those of you who have teachers and lawyers and doctors as fathers uh, and mothers, uh, please forgive the observation, but Whitman grew up knowing what real work was. He, he, his father was a construction man, and Whitman got to live the life of a kid watching a father who, for example, would lose his job and then have to move his family somewhere else to try and find work elsewhere. Whitman himself, growing up, learned what real work was early on. He never attended those kinds of lofty universities and that kind of thing. You know, Harvard was way, way, I mean, it wasn't even an idea. I couldn't afford it anyway, that kind of thing. So Whitman grows up seeing a different world than Emerson and Thoreau see. He sees real life, if you will, okay? And because he sees that, as he becomes a poet later in life, he's going to celebrate normal, everyday things that, quite frankly, Emerson and Thoreau didn't have as much understanding about at all. Whitman tries several jobs. Let's outline them quickly. Um, he's pretty much a failure at everything he tries. But for ironic reasons is he a failure. I'll give you an example. First, he's a teacher. Um, he's, a, he's a really good teacher, but he gets fired. The reasons are kind of interesting. Let me give you a few examples. One uh, time he's teaching, and two boys in his uh, school uh, get in a fight. Out in the green there in the area, and they get in a fight. Uh, and Whitman breaks it up, and he talks to both of them, and then Whitman is called into the principal's office where the principal asks him if he has paddled the two boys. Now, the primary form of discipline during Whitman's day was you were brought into the principal's office, everything was taken out of your back pockets, 
Um, I'm explaining this not because it happened to me, but because I heard about it. <laughs> then you were asked to lean over and grab hold of the table, and then the uh, administrator, teacher, principal, would then whack you on the butt with a paddle. Sometimes there were holes cut into the paddle to allow that paddle to move even faster. And it would sting, or so they tell me, it would sting really, really bad if you got in trouble and you got paddled at school. Well, the principal says to Whitman, you're in trouble because you didn't paddle the two boys who got in the fight. To which Whitman's response was, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You want me to hit the boys who are in trouble for hitting. And the principal said, that's absolutely right. And Whitman said, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask this question to you in a different way. They're in trouble, why? Because they hit each other. And for that, you want me to hit them. Really? That's what you really want me to do? And you can see, Whitman gets fired from jobs like this. His students do quite well on the science score. The school board regents want to come out and find out what is he doing in this school that allows for his students to do so well in the science tests. And as they arrive, they see Whitman and his students lying in the grass. The kids have got mud from their waist down, and they're lying in the grass. And he, they, they walk up, what in heaven's name are you doing? Oh, today was field trip day to study science. We wanted to look at frogs, and so we went down to the pond, and we all got in the pond to find frogs so that we could then study our frogs, you see. And then now we're lying on the grass studying bugs, especially the ladybugs, because there's a bunch of them in the grass. To which the response from the school board member was, we just bought you brand new books where there's pictures of frogs. Why aren't you just using your books? To which Whitman responded, why would I have them look in a book to see what I could have them see in real life? It makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. Let's say it this way. As a teacher, Whitman was a great believer in hands-on learning. If you couldn't learn it hands-on, what's the point of it? In other words, he is a pragmatist, very practical in his view of education. Uh, yeah, he doesn't last long in a classroom. From the classroom, he moves to journalism. But Whitman had a serious problem as a journalist, uh, and, and it was this. Most journalism takes place inside of a building. Whitman loved construction work because it was usually outside, and he loved to work outside in the open air. Um, he would have days when it was really beautiful out in New York, in the New York area, city, in the area. And he would look outside and see the beautiful sky and everything, and the sun shining, and he'd just go for a walk. He'd say, okay, I'm going to go for a walk. And he'd walk down to the coast and go for a swim and then lay in the grass and look at the stars, maybe take an afternoon nap. And by the time he was ready to go back to work, it was already time to not go back to work anymore because it was closed. And he'd show up the next day and they'd be like, where were you yesterday? Oh, it was too beautiful outside. I had to go for a walk and I never made it back. And they're like, dude, you cannot do this. You have to be inside working every day. And he's like, even on beautiful days when it's sunshiny outside and I want to be outside, he doesn't last very long as a journalist either, although he does get to travel some because of journalism. His third job is a job that was forced on him. It's the job of caregiver, we would call it a nurse, during the Civil War. Now, the American Civil War will have much more to say about. This war caught everybody off guard, totally off guard. The, in fact, the very first battle of this war, no kidding, I'm not making this up, People from D.C. and the surrounding areas rode their carts, their buggies, out to a little hill with picnic baskets. They were going to watch the battle because their assumption was that it would be a 20-minute ordeal. All of the southern rebels would be immediately taken care of, and they were basically there to almost like watch a play or drama. Well, if you know anything about the first battle that happened there, the South, the Confederate troops, win it and almost overrun and actually almost won the entire Civil War right at the very beginning. It came very close to a major catastrophe. That's how unprepared people in both sides were for the war, but especially in the North. They didn't understand. One of the terrible things, side effects of this war, were the wounded. Uh... Lots of people get wounded. The question then becomes, what do you do with them? Well, you put them in field hospitals. There are these tented hospitals that are in open areas outside of New York and outside of Washington, D.C. The only problem is they run very quickly out of all forms of anesthetic and painkiller. Very quickly they run out. We're talking about tens of thousands of guys get wounded right away. And the problem is the infection that sets in. So the way they solve the infection problem is to begin to amputate limbs. 
So for example, if you got a, if you got a shot in the foot, and your foot started to get gangrene and infection to save, to save you, they would just chop off your leg, saw off your leg at the knee. And then if the gangrene started in at the knee, they would saw it off at the thigh and so on and so forth to try and save you. Let's just say it, lots and lots of people said it out loud. It was way worse in the American Civil War to be wounded than it was to be killed. Because if you got wounded, you knew you were dead. It was just going to take a matter of long time. These field hospitals turn into thousands and thousands of young men lying on cots right next to each other, ostensibly all of them waiting to die. Historians and Whitman himself will report there were two things that were horrific about this. The first was the stench. Uh, the, the, in the middle of the summer, when there wasn't a lot of a breeze, they said that within miles and miles of these field hospitals, you could smell the grotesque, grotesque stench of any number of forms of death and decay. I mean, when you, when you amputated, they would just throw them in large piles. And of course, the stench was horrific. Men dying and men dead. And you know, too many people were dying to be able to often give them appropriate burial in time, and so the smell was horrific. But the second was far worse, and Whitman said it to the end of his life. He could hear the, what you could hear, the screaming, of agony of thousands and thousands of men in terrific pain. Whitman said it was a sound he could not leave after he left the hospital. And long, many years after the war, still you could, he said, in your mind's eye, you could hear the screaming of men in tremendous anguish. I mean, think about it. They're going to literally take a saw, just like a normal saw you'd cut wood with, and they're just going to cut your leg off without any painkiller. And then you get to endure the infection that sets in and the gangrene to follow and the pain involved in that. Multiply that by 10,000 male voices and then you got a sense of what. So when you put the two together, the smell and the sound, Whitman went into those tented field hospitals to serve as a nurse, not as a medical nurse, but rather as a comforter. He would show up and, for example, he would say, I'm a writer. If you want me to, I will write your letters home. And so soldiers who had been wounded would uh, dictate and he would write letters or he would bring them gifts or he would read them things and that kind of thing. There are many, argue, uh, many scholars who argue that Whitman actually, he broke his health during this time of his life. Uh, not only was he around a lot of germs and that kind of thing, but it just kind of broke him in terms of as well. It, made his, it, it hurt his mind, it hurt his soul to watch so many men in so much pain for so long. Uh, that's, that's his next job. Of course, the final job, which is the reason we're talking about him, is he's a writer. He's a poet. But he waits until his 32nd year of his life to actually start thinking about publishing his poetry. The important date for us, and there's two of us with Whitman scholarship that we have to focus on. The first is 1855, and the second is 1892. 1855 is a really pivotal moment because that's the year that he publishes his collection of poetry called Leaves of Grass. Now what's interesting is that for the next six editions, he would republish this poem, this collection of poems called Leaves of Grass. And every time he did it, he just added more poems to it. In 1892, he dies. Believe it or not, the night before he dies, he's writing new poem. And he's editing. No kidding. And so the, the published volume of Leaves of Grass from 1892, we call the Deathbed Edition. Now, when you look at the 1855 volume of Leaves of Grass, and... There aren't very many of them left. If you own a first edition of Leaves of Grass in 1855, you own something worth serious bank, serious bank. The reason is because there are only a few of them published, and most of them that were bought were actually destroyed for reasons I'll get into. Nobody read the poetry in 1855 and saw it as something important, and so there are very, very few copies of this. I was actually privileged to see a first edition of this. I was involved in a uh, Whitman conference, actually, in China many years ago, and I was able to see a first edition. You don't get to see very many of these things. What's interesting about the first edition of Leaves of Grass is how small it is. It's a very thin volume. The 1892 volume of Leaves of Grass is a pretty substantially large volume. That is to say, over the course of the years, Whitman would republish Leaves of Grass. He would add new poems, and interestingly, he would edit old poems. So you could have the same poem published several different volumes, and it actually is a different poem in terms of his editing of, uh, of, the, of the poetry. Now, that's enough of the biography. Let's start to talk a little bit about the 1855 publishing of Leaves of Grass 
and why it was such a radical moment in time. <clears throat> Whitman is radical in regards to two major reasons. We're going to use this term. He is an iconoclast. Do we know what that means to be iconoclastic? What does that mean? Give you your good ACT word of the day. What does it mean to be an iconoclast? Well, I like the term iconoblastic, not iconoclastic, and that's a good mnemonic, a good way to remember it. Icons are those things which are considered to be sacred or important. So if you are an iconoclast, you iconoblast the icons. That is to say, you take out a huge aluminum bat, you find out what's really important to people, and you go, Psh, and you bash it. That's what an iconoclast is. So Whitman, we call him iconoclastic. That is to say, he looks at what's considered to be sacred or important, and he jacks it. Whitman is an iconoclast in two major ways. First of all, as a poet. First of all, in terms of form. The form of poetry. And then secondly, in terms of content. Let's address both of these in order. First of all, to the form. Now, Whitman is a contemporary of Longfellow, although Longfellow is quite old at the time. We've seen Whitman and his ilk. Remember? Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Na 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 Whitman asked a simple question. Dude, when was the last time you heard anybody actually speak like that? People don't talk. Na 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 People don't talk like that. Whitman makes a radical decision. He invents what we will call today free verse. That is to say, Whitman says it this way. I'm going to write poetic lines that sound the way people talk. Not na 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 na. Nobody talks like that. I'm going to write poetry that tries to capture human cadence, the way people really talk. Now, the place to begin with this kind of iconoclasm is actually Emerson. Emerson kickstarted in a famous essay called The Poet. In that essay, Emerson said he was waiting for the first truly American poet who would write American things in American ways. I'm paraphrasing what Emerson said. Whitman took him to heart. And one of the things that Whitman right away wanted to do was to write a poetry that was American. Now, I think I said to you in a very early lecture together that you can define American thought as don't tell me what to do. That is absolutely true with Emerson and Thoreau, but it is even more profoundly true with Whitman. Whitman is the great don't tell me what to do poet. I will do it the way I want to do it. And that begins with form. Let me give you another example. Whitman does not write with any prescribed rhythm or rhyme. There is an irony here, by the way. Whitman lives during the Civil War. Uh, he's a great fan of Lincoln. He, like most Americans, he recognizes just how important Lincoln is to the saving of the country. So that when Lincoln is shot on that fateful evening, right after the end of the Civil War, uh, immediately Whitman will write several really important poems. One of the poems he writes is, O Captain, My Captain. Ironically, this poem is a poem of prescribed meter, rhythm, and rhyme. There actually is in rhyme. And this poem becomes the single most famous poem Whitman ever wrote. To the day he died in 1892, Whitman was asked again and again to read this poem over and over in public. He hated this poem. The reason he hated this poem was because it is a poem that's na 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 and he hated that. He hated that. He wanted to write poetry that was more experimental, more radical. When the Norton's Anthology of, of Modern Poetry was published in the 20th century, they published it in chronological form. So the obvious question is, who would be the first poet that would constitute modern poetry? And guess who it was? It was, it was actually Walt Whitman. Why? Because Whitman is going to break all of the rules and thereby invent modern poetics in Leaves of Grass. Emerson and Thoreau had both written poetry, but they had followed the rules of Longfellow. Na, 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 na. And Whitman's like, yes, bag that. I ain't writing poetry like that. Number two, in terms of form, when you looked at the poetry on the page, it didn't look like poetry. 
He allowed for his lines to run all the way across the page. It actually looked like simply a paragraph. Well, you can see this right now with me on page 510. Go ahead and look at it now. One of the famous poems of this time period is, uh, from this 1855 volume is I Hear America Singing. Notice as it's just laying there on the page, it lies without any kind of specific prescribed length of line. Do you see it? I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be, blithe and strong, the carpenter stringing his as he measures his plank or beam, the mason singing as he makes ready for work or leaves off work, the boatman singing, and on and on and on it goes, the shoemaker, the woodcutter, and so on. This was not considered poetry when it was published in 1855. It didn't look like poetry. It didn't sound like poetry. But the fact that Whitman was an iconoclast in terms of poetic form is not the reason why. When Melville, the great writer of the greatest American novel, Moby Dick, a story about a great white whale, when Melville reads in 1855 Leaves of Grass, he immediately throws it into the fire and calls it pornography, obscenity. Now, he doesn't do that because Whitman is an iconoclast of form. He does that because Whitman is an iconoclast of, the second thing for your notes, content. Whitman is radical in terms of his content. That's what makes him so controversial. And controversial he was. Really? Let's talk about why. We've got several perspectives, we will say, on Whitman and his radical views. The first will be on Whitman and his view of the self and the nation the nation of America, let's call it that. Okay. By extension, when we talk about that, we're talking about his view of occupations as well. Right. Then we'll look at views, Whitman's views on life and death. He had some radical views on life and death. Then we'll look at Whitman's views on education and pedagogy. He had a in very interesting, as we've already said, he had, as a teacher, he had differing views on school. We'll definitely see it in his, in his uh, poetry as well. And finally, his views of God and religion, theology, will recognize that Whitman was quite an iconoclast in regards to the church as well. But the place we want to begin is the place where he began, and that is Song of Myself. So let's now go in our hymnals, please, uh, to uh, page 512. And I want to get a little bit of nomenclature out of the way, so that way, as academics, we can talk about this poetry and understand what we're doing, okay? The biggest title is Leaves of Grass. That one we will always underline as the book of his poetry. The poem is called Song of Myself, and we will usually then italicize, or put in quotation marks, the title of a poem. But Song of Myself is a collection of poetry that actually has a number of poems within it, all right? So, for example, if you look on page 514, you can see passage number 52. There are 52 separate poems within Song of Myself. So when we are talking about this work, we talk about it as Leaves of Grass, Song of Myself, 1, 2, 46, 47, 52, and that we're immediately identifying as the number of poem within Song of Myself, all right? Well, let's talk about Whitman as iconoclast, and let's begin with his radical view of the self and of America. Let's say it out loud, Whitman is the first American poet. That's not to say that Emerson and Thoreau and Longfellow weren't Americans, but they were writing poetry which in many ways emulated what the British and the English and the Italians and the French were doing. Whitman is the first poet to say, I am American and I am proud of it. I'm going to sing songs, that's what he called poetry, about America. I'm not interested in Europe. I'm not interested in other parts of the world as much as I am interested in America. That's not to say, by the way, that Whitman doesn't understand the international. His passage to India proves he was acutely aware of what was happening in the rest of the world. But Whitman is the first poet to say it out loud, America is the greatest country in the world. 
Whitman is the first one to say that. Not Emerson, not Thoreau. And in fact, Emerson and Thoreau were a little bit, they were a little bit embarrassed by that. They're like, whoa, 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 we haven't been a country for long enough for you to say you're, we're the greatest country in the world. Whitman says we are the greatest country, the greatest people in the world, and we're about to prove it. He had some sense of the future that Emerson and Thoreau did not have. Whitman does this in two interesting ways. He does it in a very private way, but he does it in a very public way, too. Let's talk about the private way. It can kind of freak you out. He'll say things like this. Hey, you, there, what's it like to hold me in your hands? He'll say this in his poem, poetry. And, you're, and, and the first time you read it, you're just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then it hits you. Oh, he's talking to me. As in, to me, he will actually say, you, a hundred years from now, what's it like to live then? I wonder what it's like to live then. And, and how do I feel to you right now in your hands? Very, very personal. That is to say, Whitman somehow knew, or he believed and hoped, that his poetry would be read a hundred years from now. Emerson and Thoreau did not share that level of optimism. Whitman also, though, writes poetry about an America that's coming, when it will rule the world, when everyone will come to America because it's the greatest country in the world. Whitman writing this is writing during the time of the American Civil War. There are a large number of people, Lincoln included, we'll talk about him later, who was very, very uncertain about the future of America. In fact, in the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln himself will raise the doubt whether the experiment called America is going to work or not. Whitman never had any doubt about this. To that degree, let's call him what he is, the eternal optimist. He is tremendously optimistic about the future of America and the future of his voice within America. But let's begin, first of all, with Whitman's radical view of the self. <clears throat> it's here that we find some really interesting observations right away. Let's go to Song of Myself 1, uh, uh, poem 1. And right away, we're going to meet some pretty radical ideas. I celebrate myself and sing myself. The very first line of this poem says, I'm going to write a poem about me. What would John Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, John Edwards, what would John Edwards have had to have said about a poet who wrote a poem where his opening line was, I'm going to write a poem about how great I am. What would John Edwards have had to say about that? Yes, that, that right there is the pride that lands you in hell. That is satanic pride if ever there was satanic pride. Right away, Whitman is fairly radical. I'm going to write a poem just about me. But wait a minute. That's only the first line. Look at the second two lines, the, the next lines. And what I assume, you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. What's, put it in your own words. What's he say? What's the second two lines say? I'm going to write a poem about how special I am. But notice what he says. What I assume about myself and my uniqueness, you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as well belongs to you. What does he say? We're the same. We are the same and yet somehow radically different. I'm going to celebrate my individuality, but in my doing that, I'm going to give you license to do the same. Notice right away, the voice in this poetry is a voice spoken directly to you, the reader. Do you see that? This is a very personal kind of poetry. He will introduce himself right away as the great, mm, how would one say it, um, do nothing, the lazy man, the man who likes to kill time. Look at what he says. I loaf, the great loafer, and invite my soul. I loaf and lean at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, Whitman, is the great poet of the body. He will celebrate everything about the body. Now, in Whitman's day in 1855, you do not write poetry about sex at all. Whitman asks, why not? The only way any of us got here was two people hooked up and exchanged fluids. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely true. true. To be embarrassed by that fact, Whitman asks, why? It's not like anyone alive doesn't know that's the case. People would say, oh, well, good heavens, you don't say those kinds of things out loud. To which Whitman says, why not? Absolutely, underline the word absolutely in your notes, absolutely everything about the body, guess what? It's going to end up in this poem. Whitman will write a poem in which he celebrates the smell of armpits and the smell of farts. He will say about anything that's related to the body, he will say, why embarrassment? 
I don't understand it. Why embarrassment? We know that this is what the human body does. Instead of being embarrassed by, for example, things like sexuality, why not celebrate it? It is quite remarkable, so why not enjoy that fact and celebrate it? Notice how he starts right away. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from the soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. He will celebrate he's from America. He will celebrate that there's an ancestry that is directly related to the land. That will make Whitman the great American poet. And to this day, Whitman is considered the greatest American poet. That's not that Longfellow couldn't write good poetry. It's that Whitman is quintessentially at his core an American poet. Notice he tells us who he is. I, now, 37 years old in perfect health, begin hoping to cease not till death. So at the age of 37, he sits down and says, I'm going to write a collection of poems. I'm going to call it Leaves of Grass, but I won't be finished when I'm finished. I'm going to keep writing poetry until the day I die. And he did it. Right? Like I said, in 1892, he was writing a poem the night before he died. He was a poet for the rest of his life, but he also did other things. Like we said, he was a nurse during the, the Civil War. The collection of poetry that he would publish after the Civil War, called Drum Taps, will tell haunting, haunting pictures of what it was like during the Civil War. He will give you a picture, for example, from inside one of those tents where he's sitting next to a guy. Or he'll imagine a letter that gets sent home to a mom and a dad of one of the uh, soldiers who has been wounded and hopes to return but probably never will. So he gives these pictures. Notice he continues creeds and schools in abeyance. Uh-oh, there it is. Whitman, the iconoclast. Creeds, other related to religion and church. Schools, we're familiar. He says about what churches and schools have to say, I'm going to just set it aside for a second. Abeyance, that's what he means. Re uh, notice, retiring back a while, sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. Let's point out, Whitman is not opposed to education in schools and churches, but what he will say is, if you're ever going to be an individual, does this sound like Emerson or what? You're going to have to make up your own mind about what it is that you believe in those two areas of school and church. That's his point. I labor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard. He's going to say whatever comes to mind. Nature without check. And then maybe the most important lines of all of anything he ever wrote, because it captures everything about Whitman, with original energy. Whitman argued Americans are different because of their energy. He argued that the world would become under the control of America, economically, for example, because Americans had more energy than the rest of the world. Of course, when Whitman is writing, think about it, America's not even 100 years yet old, right? I mean, think about that. We said 1855, do the quick mathematics. Jefferson will write, we hold these truths to be self-evident in 1776. So you can do the quick mathematics from Jefferson to Whitman. We have a tendency to kind of think of that as really a long time, but think about that. Jefferson writes in 1776, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Whitman publishes these lines in 1855, right? So you can get kind of a sense of the timing here, right? We're 20 years away from it being 100 years from Jefferson's time, right? So America is still a fairly young country, and yet Whitman will celebrate the energy. All right, let's turn now to Whitman as iconoclastic in his view of life and death. In, in one of the most famous passages, passage six of Song of Myself, we're going to hear Whitman's view of living and dying. Uh, may I say this out loud? Lots and lots of people after 1855 want this material read at funerals. Gee, I wonder why. Let's take a look and see. A famous opening set of lines. A child said, what is the grass? fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. Notice already the radical view of education. Kids come to ask the adult, picks up the grass at the park or whatever, what is this stuff? Normally an adult will say something like, 
That's called the grass. Let me explain to you the compounds. Let me explain to you the whole thing of photosynthesis and why it's such a blah, 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 blah. Notice Whitman is the teacher. I don't know. I don't know what that is. I don't know any more than you what that is. Let 